This is a Fox News alert. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, under fire tonight from President Trump. A blistering presidential statement this afternoon saying when Bannon was fired, he, quote, not only lost his job, he lost his mind. The jaw-dropping response coming hours after excerpts from a new book were published in which Bannon called a 2016 meeting between Trump campaign officials and a Russian lawyer, quote, treasonous and unpatriotic. Bannon also warned that a special counsel investigation that looked into money laundering could take down members of the president's family and topple his presidency. The White House now calls this book trashy tabloid fiction. But the author says he was given unfettered access inside the early days of the Trump White House and completed more than 200 interviews, many of them on the record. Correspondent Kevin Cork is following all the developments from the North Lawn. Good evening, Kevin. Hey there, Brett, from a very chilly White House North Lawn. Actually, I think this is important to point out for the viewers at home. Steve Bannon wasn't officially a part of the Trump campaign at the time of that now infamous meeting over at Trump Tower. But that has not stopped him from not only weighing in on it, but also from uh, leveling some pretty serious accusations. And that left the White House today in a fighting mood. Did the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., commit treason? Is the president now blocking Steve Bannon? How surprised were you at what you read? An otherwise frigid day in the nation's capital suddenly turned white hot with controversy. I think um, furious, disgusted would probably certainly fit when you uh, make such outrageous claims and completely false claims against the president, uh, his administration, and his family. White House officials reacting to explosive excerpts that surfaced from the forthcoming book fire and fury inside the Trump White House. I know that the book is uh, has a lot of things so far of what we've seen that are completely untrue. You have many people that have uh, quotes that are sourced to them that are now coming out publicly and saying that those things are not true. In the book, author Michael Wolf reports that the president's former chief strategist Steve Bannon described the now infamous Trump Tower meeting between the president's son and a group of Russians during the 2016 campaign as, quote, treasonous and unpatriotic. Bannon reportedly said that he believed that after the meeting, the Russians were taken to see then-candidate Trump himself. The chance that Don Jr. didn't walk these Jumos up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero, he said. President Trump has repeatedly denied meeting Russians during the campaign. As for the ongoing Russia probe, Bannon surmised that special counsel Bob Mueller is focusing his attention on possible money laundering involving Trump acolytes in an effort to ensnare the president. They're going to crack Don Jr. like an egg on national TV, he said. The president, who's not been seen on camera since returning from his holiday vacation to Florida, issued a blistering response, saying in part, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Adding, Steve doesn't represent my base, he's only in it for himself. Bannon's suggestions in the book appear in sharp contrast to an interview no he gave saying. last year no about so-called Russian collusion. Look, I was there. It's a total and complete farce. Russian collusion is a farce. Okay. The row over the book comes as another controversy was brewing over the president's tweet about North Korea, in which he suggested that his so-called nuclear button was bigger and more powerful than that of Kim Jong-un. An online outburst Serious deemed by some as abroad. unbecoming. President Trump seems happy with macho boasts and belligerent threats that get us nowhere. President Trump's foreign policy by tweet will not advance our standing in the world. Back to the book for just a second there, Brett. The First Lady's office is also weighing in on this. Stephanie Grisham, the spokesperson for the First Lady, saying that this book is destined to be clearly sold in the fiction section of the bookstores. It'll sell nonetheless, right? Much more on all this with the panel. Kevin, thank you. Mm -hmm. Plenty of news surrounding the Russia investigation today. Late this afternoon, President Trump's former campaign manager filed suit against special counsel Robert Mueller and the deputy attorney general, calling it beyond its scope. Meantime, the founders of the firm Fusion GPS behind the Trump dossier are speaking out, insisting the controversial document was not the start of the FBI's investigation. And today is also the deadline set by the House Intelligence Chair for the FBI to turn over all documents related to the Russian collusion probe or face a contempt of Congress citation.
Just a short time ago, Chairman Devin Nunez said they have yet to receive anything. And at this hour, some breaking news on Capitol Hill. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris is here with the latest. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. Fox News also understands the Deputy Attorney General and FBI Director requested and got a meeting today with the House Speaker about the Russia case. A short time ago, the Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein passed reporters without taking questions. All this as a key defendant launches a new line of attack. According to the 17-page civil complaint, former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort and his legal team argue the Russia probe has gone beyond the scope of the special counsel regulations, calling Robert Mueller's investigation unmoored from the original mandate to investigate links and or coordination between Russia and the Trump campaign. There may be a fair legal question about the scope of the, of the independent prosecutor's jurisdiction. But Judge Jackson will decide that. The judge that actually has the criminal case in front of her is the one who's going to have the final say on that. In October, Manafort and his business partner Rick Gates pled not guilty to allegations of money laundering and making false statements for their work in Ukraine. The attorneys are now under a gag order, but said at the time there was no Russia connection. Those activities ended in 2014, over two years before Mr. Manafort served in the Trump campaign. Writing in the New York Times, the opposition research firm behind the unverified Trump dossier called on Congress to release transcripts of their closed-door testimony. The co-founders of Fusion GPS said they do not believe the dossier alone sparked the FBI Russia case. But Republican Senator Chuck Grassley called out the former journalists, who he says demanded the transcripts be kept confidential and refused to answer dozens of questions voluntarily. Grassley said the committee's invitation to testify publicly remains on the table. New details confirmed by Fox News raise questions about whether a May 2016 meeting between an Australian diplomat and a Trump campaign aide kickstarted the probe. The former director of national intelligence said this week the campaign aide was not on his radar. George Papadopoulos was not a name on my scope uh, when I left now almost a year ago. Um, I think it would it probably was one of several uh, stimulants for the investigation, but was not the only factor. Sources tell Fox the Australian government first made contact with U.S. officials in London about Papadopoulos and his claims Russia had damaging information on Hillary Clinton. But Australia's ambassador to the United States did not formally meet with the FBI until after the Democratic Convention, which ended July 28th. The hacked emails were already public. On the Manafort suit, the Justice Department called it, quote, frivolous, adding the defendant is entitled to file whatever he wants. There was no immediate response from the special counsel's office, Brent. A lot to cover today, but as far as that deadline, we don't know what justice or the FBI is going to eventually do with the Intelligence Committee, right? Okay, so they've got this deadline to provide documents they have really until midnight tonight, but a source close to the matter in Congress said to me that there are a number of options on the table and there will be a next step for the committee if they don't comply. That could be issuing new subpoenas. It could also be moving forward with contempt of Congress. Okay, Captain, thank you. You're welcome. The communication lines are now open between North and South Korea in a historic move by the North Korean regime. Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent Greg Palcott reports tonight on the established connection in a spot between the two countries that we took you to in November. North and South Korea are talking to each other again. Kim Jong-un giving the okay to reopen a hotline between the two countries in Panmunjom at the DMZ. Officials from both sides spoke today for 20 minutes, mostly technicalities, but it was the first such dialogue in nearly two years. This followed a request by Kim Jong-un in his New Year's address to start discussions with South Korea about sending athletes to the Winter Olympics there next month. South Korea proposed a meeting next week at the DMZ. Kim Jong-un's regime hasn't accepted yet, but it sounds positive about the talks and not just about the Olympics. This will be a meaningful start for improving North-South relations in the current situation. In a visit to the DMZ last November, our colleague Brett Baer got a sense of how officially underused the facilities there are including the Peace House, which might be the scene of next week's meeting. When was the last time the North Koreans were in here? Uh, for this meeting, it was May of 2009. Uh, however, the North Koreans are in here uh, every day, five or six days a week with tours. And as for communications, another military hotline, different than the one activated today, has also been little used. From that building, we have a hotline you can kind of see the wire drucked across uh, to North Korea. It's a ring-down phone. Uh, it works 
and you know we test it four times a day. So basically, you pick it up, it rings there. Yes, sir. They're just not answering it right now. No, no answer. If things are getting better connected between North and South Korea, the gap between Pyongyang and Washington is getting wider. The regime of Kim Jong-un has yet to react to President Trump's latest tweet stating his nuclear button is bigger and stronger than Kim's. A North Korean ally, China, has. We hope North Korea and the U.S. can resume dialogue and establish mutual trust as soon as possible, instead of showing assertiveness to each other and challenging each other. Considering the growing nuclear threat posed by Kim Jong-un, President Trump's supporters think his message is just right, aimed to remind him that unless he capitulates and denuclearizes, we're on a path to exercise a military option. Officially, the Trump administration is taking a wait-and-see attitude as to whether talks between North and South Korea go anywhere, with the knowledge that all sides have been here before. Brett. Greg, thank you. Iran's Revolutionary Guard claims the days of anti-government protests are over. But as correspondent Rich Edson reports, the Trump administration is not finished calling for worldwide support for the uprisings. State television in Iran. Thousands demonstrating in support of the regime. Analysts say many are government workers. Iran's government insists it has defeated what it calls the sedition and that anti-government protests are under control. One analyst says that's wrong. There are reports that uh, the insurgents have attacked government offices, uh, burned down posters of Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader, uh, besieged uh, Revolutionary Guards uh, bases. So there's a lot going on. And the Trump administration from the top is firmly siding with the protesters. President Trump tweeted this morning, quote, such respect for the people of Iran as they try to take back their corrupt government. You will see great support from the United States at the appropriate time. You now have a president who has spoken unequivocally on behalf of those people, said he stands with them. More than 20 are dead in anti-government protests in dozens of cities across Iran. They say they're demonstrating against a poor economy, government corruption, and Iran's expensive international agenda and proxy wars. State Department officials say they're monitoring the protests, preparing additional sanctions if Iran cracks down violently against the protesters. The State Department is also pushing for social media access in Iran, posting in Farsi on its Facebook page and Twitter feed messages of support. Analysts say these widespread protests appear appear to have surprised the regime, and they expect the instability to continue. The Iranian uh, regime will not easily change. I don't think it could easily be overthrown. Uh, it is still quite strong. Uh, they haven't cracked down as harshly as they could have because they're worried about the consequences. Iran blames these protests on its enemies, presumably the United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. To concerns administration support of the protesters gives Iran an excuse to blame the U.S., State Department officials say Iran was going to do that anyway. Later this month, the Trump administration has another deadline on the Iran nuclear deal to determine if Iran is complying with the bulk of the agreement or whether to withdraw. The United States is still in and adhering to the Iran nuclear agreement. Brett. Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thank you. Last night during our show, we brought you the tweets from President Trump in which he questioned whether the U.S. should cut foreign aid to Palestinians if they didn't agree to move forward with peace talks. Correspondent Connor Powell reports on the president's power play and the possible repercussions. Tensions once again flaring up between President Trump and the Palestinians after he issued a pair of tweets threatening to cut American financial aid. We pay the Palestinians, the president tweeted, hundreds of millions of dollars and get no appreciation or respect. They don't even want to negotiate a long overdue peace treaty with Israel. President Trump then went on to add that the most difficult part of the negotiations, Jerusalem's final status, was now off the table following his recognition of the holy city as the capital of Israel. Like Israelis, Palestinians also want part of Jerusalem as the capital of their future state. Senior Palestinian officials said they will not be blackmailed by Mr. Trump. He has not only disqualified himself as a peace broker or a mediator by taking sides and by becoming complicit in Israel's occupation. He has also 
totally sabotaged here, totally destroyed the very foundations of peace. The U.S. is by far the largest financial supporter of the Palestinians, contributing more than $600 million a year for schools, development projects, and to the Palestinian security forces, which work hand in hand with Israeli security. This latest fight between President Trump and the Palestinians will make it all the more difficult to restart peace talks, let alone find a permanent solution to the conflict here. Brett? Connor Powell in Jerusalem. Connor, thank you. A new year, a new agenda, and a couple of new senators sworn in in front of three VPs. A wrap up of all the happenings on Capitol Hill next. Victims of the Las Vegas concert shooting can now apply for financial help. A link to apply for assistance from the Las Vegas Victims Fund became available this week. More than $22 million has already been raised to assist victims of the October 1st shooting that left 58 people dead and more than 500 injured. The Trump administration reached out to congressional leaders on Capitol Hill this afternoon in hopes of reaching a deal to keep the government running past January 19th. This, as the newest members of the Senate got a special welcome to Washington, Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel has our report. Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States? Two new Democrat senators sworn in by Vice President Mike Pence, Doug Jones of Alabama, shifting the balance of power to 51-49, weakening the Republican's slim hold on their majority, and Tina Smith of Minnesota replacing Al Franken, who resigned. It was a unique moment with three vice presidents on hand, Mike Pence and Democrats Joe Biden and Walter Mondale, escorting the new senators. But amid the pomp and circumstance, there are signs Democrats intend to start a new year by flexing some muscle. We are moving closer and closer to parity, closer and closer to one another, and I hope closer and closer in solving problems. Also today, the big four on Capitol Hill, Ryan Pelosi, McConnell and Schumer, met with key White House figures Mick Mulvaney and Mark Short to try to hammer out spending caps in search of a two-year budget agreement. Sources suggest a deal could be reached by raising the current caps by $200 billion over the next two years. McConnell's emphasis is on rebuilding the military. Since fiscal year 2013, defense cuts have outpaced domestic spending cuts by $85 billion. To fix this, we need to set aside the arbitrary notion that new defense spending be matched equally by new non-defense spending. But Democrats are digging in, saying there needs to be a matching increase on domestic priorities. We can start on the budget with opioids, veterans' health care and pensions, with children's health insurance and disaster aid, and we can resolve the fate of the dreamers. Jamás será vencido. Republicans don't want those so-called dreamers, children brought to this country illegally by their parents, to complicate budget talks. There is calendar pressure on all, with the House not returning until January 8th and the government due to run out of money 11 days later. Both parties have to be willing to come to the table. We've been there from the beginning. Hopefully the Democrats get there too. Late today, both sides put out carefully worded statements about it being a positive meeting and that they shared their priorities. Republicans added it is important that members of Congress do not hold funding for our troops hostage for immigration. Brett? Mike Emanuel live on the Hill. Mike, thank you. The path is clear for a drawing Thursday that could determine control of Virginia's House of Delegates. Told you this story before. A three-judge panel denied Democrat Shelley Simons or Simmons' request to undo its decision to strip her of a one-vote victory after a dramatic recount of November's election. Election officials plan to randomly pick a winner in the contest tomorrow. If incumbent David Yancey wins, Republicans will have a 51-49 majority. The Secret Service confirms firefighters responded to the Chappaqua, New York property of Bill and Hillary Clinton this afternoon. A spokesman says there was a small fire in the ceiling of a building behind the Clinton's home and that they were able to stop the fire using fire extinguishers while the fire department responded to make sure it was completely out. The former president and first lady were not home at the time.
Up next, what to expect and when to expect it as wicked winter storm rolls into the east and almost into the Midwest. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 43 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where environmental officials have ordered Sunoco to halt construction of a $2.5 billion natural gas pipeline due to a number of spills and other violations. The Department of Environmental Protection is ordering Sunoco to come up with a plan to fix the problems. Sunoco has yet to comment on the issue. Fox 2 in San Francisco, where computer issues caused problems in the first week of recreational pot sales in California. The state's computer system to track the pot to make sure it doesn't hit the black market is not working. Instead, businesses are being asked to document sales and transfers of pot using pen and pad. Word is it could take months before that tracking system launches. And this is a live look at Times Square from Fox 5, our affiliate there. That's where hundreds of new protective barriers will be permanently installed in Times Square and around New York City in an effort to block cars from hitting pedestrians. New security measures come after two vehicle attacks in New York last year. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. They're calling it a bomb cyclone. It's expected to live up to its name, bringing snow, ice, and hurricane force winds from Iowa all the way to the entire East Coast. We're tracking the storm with meteorologist Adam Klotz, but we begin with correspondent Brian Yenis out in the frigid temperatures in Boston. Good evening, Brian. Good evening, Brett. Well, here in Boston's Copley Square, it is a balmy 24 degrees, relatively warm, given that it's the first time in eight days the temperature is over 20 degrees. And you know what? Boston just had its coldest week in 100 years, and yet still they are preparing for a fast-moving snowstorm that's moving so rapidly and intensifying so quickly. It's being called the bomb cyclone. The storm already causing snow to fall in Tallahassee, Florida, for the first time in nearly 30 30 years, about a tenth of an inch of snow down there. It doesn't happen there. And in New York, Coast Guard cutters are already clearing the way for barges in New York on the Hudson River near Kingston, New York. Of course, much of the heating oil is delivered by barges there. Our Fox News drone capturing that. And here in Boston, a blizzard warning is in effect. Some 40,000 tons of salt is ready and in place. 700 pieces of equipment is also ready, and about a foot of snow is expected. Expected. If we don't get the main thoroughfares plowed from corner to corner, um, from, from curb to curb, I should say, uh, that snow could be there for a while. And Boston Public Schools are closed tomorrow. Hurricane force winds are expected along the coast of Massachusetts, causing perhaps power outages and coastal flooding is also expected. A big concern considering a deep freeze is expected Friday and Saturday. We're talking about lows of minus 20. Already at least 17 people have been killed, blamed on this wicked cold that is just all around the country in the last week. Brett? Minus 20. Stay warm. Uh, Brett? Thanks. Let's turn to meteorologist Adam Klotz now with a look at the path of this storm and what's possible. Good evening, Adam. Hey, good evening there, Brett. Yeah, we're going to watch this run up the coast tonight. It's a fast mover, as you heard Brian say, also known as the bomb cyclone. The reason for that, and you've been seeing it all over social media, this storm going to lose a lot of pressure. So a very deep, low pressure system as it moves up the coast. It has to happen quickly to get that title, and it's going to. That's what you're noticing when this really explodes and spreads out running up into New England overnight tonight, but more so into Thursday and then eventually into Friday. The problem, obviously, with all this, it's running through what is already some very frigid air. These are your current temperatures with falling down into the below freezing range, the 20s it already in the path of this storm. It is going to bring colder air before it's all said and done. But as it makes that move in the last 12 hours or so, we've seen snow in portions of northern Florida. We've seen snow in areas of Georgia now running up into the Carolinas as this continues to track north at a pretty quick pace. Here is our hour by hour forecast. If you live along the coast, you can pay attention to it and see where you are. Your time stamp there. Put this into motion. Arriving in D.C. and New York through the overnight hours, likely New York after midnight, continuing to work its way up to Boston. As it moves that direction, this is going to get a little bit closer to the shore. 
The closer to the shore this system is, the heavier the snowfall is going to be. That's why we're talking about heavier snow running up to Boston, running up into portions of Maine, uh, where this is really going to be coming down. And yes, Brett, uh, unfortunately, it stays really cold. We get on the backside of this, 13 degrees in New York City on Friday. Plenty of spots just off to our west, down into single digits. So this is going to be a problem for a lot of folks. Wow. Adam, thank you. We'll track it. Yep. In economic news, Federal Reserve officials were mainly on the same page last month, agreeing the tax overhaul would benefit the U.S. economy, but they were split on whether that would warrant a faster pace of rate hikes this year. Minutes of the Fed's December meeting indicate disagreement over how many times the Fed should raise its benchmark interest rate. Some felt the projection of three rate hikes might be too aggressive and prevent inflation from returning to the Fed's 2% target. Obviously, the markets like that. Another banner day for the markets, with all three indices finishing at record highs again. The Dow gaining 99 today. The S&P 500 was up 17. The Nasdaq with another big day, 59 points today. Up next, the president versus his former chief strategist. The panel reacts to this very public fight and a new bombshell-filled book, First Beyond Our Borders tonight. In Western Europe, where a violent storm that packed winds up to 100 miles per hour, that storm with heavy rain, hail, and lightning, knocking out power for thousands of homes, spanning France, Great Britain, and Ireland. The, in Ottawa, former hostage Joshua Boyle is facing a slew of charges, including sexual assault. Boyle and his wife, Caitlin, and their three children were freed, you may remember, in October from Pakistan after five years of captivity with the Taliban. His wife told a local paper the trauma her husband endured during captivity led to his behavior. And in Britain, the National Health Service is calling for a delay in non-urgent procedures to free up staff and beds for emergency patients. Officials blame unprecedented winter demand for that move. The restrictions will run through at least the end of January, affecting about 55,000 operations. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. I think um, furious, disgusted would probably certainly fit when you uh, make such outrageous claims and completely false claims against the president, uh, his administration, and his family. I know that the book is uh, has a lot of things so far of what we've seen that are completely untrue. You have many people that have uh, quotes that are sourced to them that are now coming out publicly and saying that those things are not true. This was quite a day in Washington, uh, talking there about President Trump and his former White House chief strategist, Steve Bannon, uh, close at one time. Today, the president issuing this statement, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Steve was a staffer who worked for me after I had already won the nomination by defeating 17 candidates. Now that he's on his own, Steve is learning that winning isn't as easy as I make it look. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory, yet Steve had, had everything to do with the loss of a Senate seat in Alabama held for more than 30 years by Republicans. Steve doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. Steve pretends to be at war with the media, which he calls the opposition party, yet he spent his time at the White House leaking false information to the media to make himself seem far more important than he was. It is the only thing he does well. Steve was rarely in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and only pretends to have had influence to fool a few people with no access and no clue whom he helped write phony books. Okay, that's all in response to this book that came out, uh, it's coming out, but the excerpts from it came out today. Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, in which Bannon, among other things, is quoted about the Mueller probe. This is all about money laundering. Mueller chose senior prosecutor Andrew Weissman first, and he's a money laundering guy. Their path to effing Trump goes right through Paul Manafort, Don Jr., and Jared Kushner. It's as plain as a hair on your face. There's a lot of other things in this book. We'll talk about some of them. Let's bring in our expanded panel, Jonathan Swan, national political reporter for Axios, Byron York, chief political correspondent of the Washington Examiner, Amy Walter, national editor for the Cook Political Report, and Guy Benson, political editor at townhall.com. Okay, Jonathan, uh, first of all, any have we heard from Steve Bannon in response to this? Uh... 
I can say I've been texting with him all day, but it's all off the record, so okay. I don't want to say anything right. about it. Well, how about can we? How Washington is digesting all of this? Well, it was very clear straight away uh, that Bannon had touched a third rail of Trump world with these uh, comments. He said a lot of stuff about Jared Kushner in the past, but he went after Don Jr., a, a blood relative, the president's eldest son, uh, insinuated that he was part of potentially a money laundering scheme. Uh, insinuated that he was stupid, would be, I think he said, cracked like an egg on live television, uh, all sorts of things, described him as treasonous. Uh, it, it's pretty extraordinary. So um, immediately, it was very interesting because normally when Bannon does something foolish, his allies quickly, quickly create an echo chamber of, no, everything's great, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We heard none of that today. It was complete silence. And the reason was uh, they didn't think it was uh, brilliant strategic thinking from the former chief strategist. Yeah. Uh, here's Sarah Sanders, uh, the statement on the book overall. The book is filled with false and misleading accounts from individuals who have no access or influence with the White House. Participating in a book that can only be described as trashy tabloid fiction exposes their sad, desperate attempts at relevancy. Byron, the problem is that Wolf says that it came because he was granted access to the White House and did over 200 interviews with early days of Trump White House officials. Well, this was in the Wild West days of the Trump White House when there was all sorts of crazy access being gotten. And Bannon has said a lot of things in different interviews. He said a lot of stuff in a recent Vanity Fair interview. Um, I think one of the key words in the president's statement was the word staffer, which is uh, the president's way of downplaying uh, Steve Bannon's role in every campaign or a White House or even an office. Uh, there is some staffer who thinks he is the smartest guy in the room and who is the one who is truly responsible for the success of the candidate or the president or even just the boss. And, can and, and Bannon has now added to that role the role of disgruntled former employee. And there are a lot of people after the Alabama disaster who are hoping that Steve Bannon has finally stepped in it big time, has gone too far, and uh, will hurt himself. And we're seeing, I think, some effects even now in some of the races uh, where some candidates like Kelly Ward in Arizona are now saying, they're not quite saying, who's Steve Bannon, but they are distancing themselves from him. What it was amazing was when the statement came out from the president, which obviously was essentially a, a blowtorch, uh, there was one tweet from the Senate Majority's office. <laughs> one tweet. And here it is. It was a GIF in which it shows Mitch McConnell just on a loop smiling. <laughs> Didn't say one thing. Nope. Didn't have any Didn't text. Doesn't have to say anything. Doesn't have to say anything. Why Doesn't... is he smiling, Amy Walter? For exactly the reason that Byron brought up is all of these insurgent candidates that Bannon is supposedly responsible for encouraging this movement now to get in and challenge the establishment to disrupt the, uh, the wing of the party built by people like the Senate Majority Leader. Well, now that has become somewhat toxic. And when you have people who've been endorsed by him now sort of saying, well, you know, I still, I, he's fine, he's f everything, but well, I like getting endorsements from a lot of different people. You know, in a war between Bannon and Trump, all those candidates are going to pick Trump's side. This is not like the divorce where they really feel like they have to be equal to both partners in this thing. The real question, though, in my mind, though, is whether or not this will continue beyond a few news cycles and when we get into these primaries this the issue of the sort of anti-establishment versus establishment the senate majority leader and his tr troubles or with the base and the base itself has always been uh or excuse me, started long before Steve Bannon. It's always been about something bigger than Steve Bannon or, or Donald Trump. It's been about this frustration from the base with what they see as an establishment pushing an agenda that does not align with their own agenda. So I don't know that that part goes away. Maybe Bannon isn't the person who's encouraging these people to run, but let's also remember, it's not like Bannon was bankrolling these people. He didn't have money, he didn't have an organization. It's the other folks with the money in the organization that I'm gonna be spending the time watching. And others. Yeah. Are you gonna oh, say? There's also sort of a delicious irony here because Bannon's people have been asking every candidate, are you gonna support Mitch McConnell? Well, now the reverse is going to happen. Mm. These candidates are being mm -hmm. asked, do you stick with Steve Bannon? And that's what struck me today. The White House puts out this blistering statement that sounds very much like it was dictated by the man himself, just uh, the, the verbiage of it. 
and you get the statement that comes out and then over the course of a few hours into my inbox comes an in case you missed it email from the Republican National Committee and from the Senate Leadership Fund, which is Mitch McConnell's group. So you've got the entire Republican Party at war with Steve Bannon, led by the president himself. And I think the trouble for Bannon here is his entire persona is that of a kingmaker. That's how he's fancied himself after the Trump victory. And he tried to crown Roy Moore, which was a total disaster for the party, losing an unlosable seat. And now he's tried to shiv the king thinking that maybe people will be loyal to him. No, in this analogy, they're loyal to the king, who is President Trump. Well, Byron, let me ask you about the substance of this. We, we talked about the, the charge from Bannon about that meeting in Trump Tower in 2016. Here's the quote. Even if you thought that this was not treasonous or unpatriotic or bad s, and I happen to think it's all of that, you should have called the FBI immediately. The chance that Don Jr. did not walk these Jamos up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero. They're going to crack Don Jr. like an egg on national TV. Is that problematic, and does that somehow become part of the Mueller investigation or congressional investigations on Capitol Hill? Well, he gets points for Jamos. That was good. But uh, I think this buys him a lot of trouble on, on Capitol Hill because we have heard today already lawmakers who are leading the congressional investigations. There are basically three fairly big ones, the two intelligence committees and House and Senate plus the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and they're going to want to hear him say why he has characterized Don Trump Jr.'s uh, behavior as treasonous. Does he, he wasn't in the campaign at that time the meeting took place, but he joined in August. Did he learn something during his time in the campaign from the inside that gave him an insight into what was going on with these uh, Russians who had come in uh, teasing explosive information about Hillary Clinton? Uh, this is going to earn Bannon a lot of trouble. He has said several times he doesn't have a lawyer, he has no interest in all this stuff. He has an interest in it now. Here's Newt Gingrich uh, today from the White House, actually. Bannon has an exaggerated sense of self-importance, and the news media, of course, builds it up because it's exactly in the age of the Kardashians, the kind of nonsense that they love to fill time and space with. It's noise. It's, it has nothing to do with the things that matter to America and the things that matter to the American people uh, have no relationship to the kind of noise that we're going to spend all day today with. Jonathan. Oh, he makes a pretty good point. But um, again, I, I think we do need to pay attention to the people that are around the president because they are important into the information he receives, the counsel he receives, the way he makes decisions. And they've been a pretty interesting bunch of people. This is going to be, Amy, it's going to suck up a lot of oxygen, yes. this book. That we haven't even Because we're only into, on, right, we're only on we're one on excerpt. excerpt. We have I an mean, entire book yet of, to come of on-the-record stuff, characterizing the new president, characterizing how they get in, uh, that they were surprised to win, et cetera, et cetera. Some of this we've reported uh, anecdotally, but some of it is is pretty stunning. It, and then we're going to also have folks who are going to be asked on the record, did you actually say this, people who aren't Steve Bannon, but other folks, who are either going to deny it or maybe do issue a non-denial denial. There's been a couple so of those. There'll be a whole story about Tom what Barack are they really saying. That's right. And um, I think um, uh, one of the RNC folks came out already and, and said that those weren't her quotes. She never said this. So there's going to be a lot of back and forth about that. But this is going to be, again, part of the sucking, you know, oxygen sucking out. Remember what this was supposed to be. These next couple of weeks are about, is the government going to stay open? And the president still, his number one priority has to be selling this tax bill, their big accomplishment. They got done at the end of this year. They still need to go out and make the case and sell it. Last point for me, the excerpt that you just read from what Bannon said, that was not just taking shots at Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort and the president's son. He implicated the president in that quote, saying there is a 0% chance that that Russia quote unquote collusion meeting did not make it Which to the Trump's president office. Denies. Yeah, but that, to me, that is like, that is the most oxygen that has been provided to the Democratic narrative on the Russia story, maybe ever. And it comes from Steve Bannon. That's like Maxine Waters level stuff with treason. It's coming from Steve Bannon. You just sort of, you catch your breath. 
Never a dull moment here. I will say that on a number of channels that lambasted Steve Bannon for weeks and weeks and weeks, he is now a crowning, um, you know, respected <laughs> figure of uh, he tech. Contribute a contract. He might right. be able to on a couple of channels. Uh, next up, reopening communication lines between North and South Korea as the rhetoric heats up from the White House to Pyongyang. One tweet caught the imagination of a lot of people and perhaps the fear of others. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food star of regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it is much bigger and more powerful, a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. Um, a lot of fallout from that. Uh, today, we hear that the North and South are going to be talking directly. Amy, your thoughts? Well, the North and South talking directly would be a new development and probably a good development. The question is, does it, is this really about just the Olympics and the South making sure that nothing bad happens while the Olympics uh, take place in February? So it would be nice to have some North K Korean athletes there to ensure that everybody stays safe if North Korean athletes are participating. Um, but I guess we're going to find out once the Olympics are over whether we see this uh, continuing beyond. Um, the real a concern, of course, is these tweets about nuclear button pushing um, are scary and uh, should not be taken lightly. And then for Kim Jong Un to do it is one thing. I think the president, e even uh, in any sarcastic way, joking about a button um, is really dangerous. Yeah, um, his supporters say it was tongue in cheek. He's not going to be pushed around by the leader of North Korea, Byron. Well, as with so many things in this Trump administration, this is all going on two levels. I mean, on one level, there is the Twitter war aspect of it, which is correct. Talking about nuclear holocaust is is terrifying. On the other hand, it's also kind of classic Trumpian trash talk. Uh, so on that, you have one level, of a, tr a Twitter war, and then on the another level, you have actual policy negotiations and maybe some progress here. It's not bad what's happened now with this uh, new line of communication or restored line of communication between uh, North and South. So this is, this is just classic Trump. It's just uh, at another level because we're talking about nuclear war. Yeah. Uh, temperament has been a real struggle for this president in the polls dating back as long as he's been a candidate. And a lot of Americans, a majority of Americans, don't believe he has the temperament to be president. And it's that tweet that we just saw that helps explain why. Being cavalier about tweeting and feuding with people is one thing. Feuding with a tin pot dictator with nuclear technology and long-range missiles sort of goading him in certain ways is something that does, I think, frighten people. And it penetrates through to even friends of mine who aren't that political. They see this tweet pop up in the news and they're like, what is the president doing tweeting about that? Right. I will say that I did hear from others who said, yeah, tell them, you know, don't do that. You know, like, I mean, uh, but there's yeah. a, listen. It's a different thought process I mean, that you're th you're thinking about these tweets in two different levels, as Byron says. Half the challenge about thinking about Trump and reporting about Trump is figuring out what to hyperventilate about and what not to hyperventilate about. And this is one of those areas where we know we sometimes say this is not normal. This really isn't normal. No, the, that's the, clear. The, I mean, we can make that truly statement. aberrant to to escalate uh, nuclear conflict into this kind of um, a sphere. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that matches what he's going to do. You know, from an action point of view. Nonetheless, uh, it's concerning to to see it. You were going to say, Amy? Well, quickly. and I do wonder if we have a North and South Korea. Are we going to be we meaning the United States? Do we still become part of this new whatever the new developments are? By mm -hmm. I think that's the next question. It's right, good right. for the lines of communication yeah. to be open, but do we get cut out a from another thing the quickly, piece? Another thing that's concerned people internally, and again, this could just be Trump's style, is he just keeps asking in these meetings about the military options. And that might just be because he likes a lot of feedback and likes hearing it, but it's certainly concerned at least one of his aides. Well, especially weeks before the Olympics. I mean, that's quite something uh, in South Korea. When we come back, the return of Special Report Online.
Finally, well, tonight, a new year means the renewal of Special Report Online. If you've never joined us, this is your invitation. Much more relaxed version of the All-Star panel. All you have to do is head to foxnews.com slash special report. On the left side of the page, you see here, click Watch Now. You can post your comments or questions if the panel will tackle almost all of them, a lot of them. All right, we'll get to a lot of them. It's a new chat system, though. It should run a lot smoother in 2018, though you may need to reset your password to log in. That's a warning. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. And while you're logging on, the story hosted by...